Okay, thank you all for being here at this late hour at the end of the first conference day. My name is Lori Troutman, and I am going to introduce the keynote to you tonight. So, here I go. Since getting his master's degree in health services and public health research from the University of Aberdeen in 2001, Dr. Donald Nicholson has worked in health services research on several high-profile multidisciplinary and multinational, multinational projects for the likes of NICE, Cochrane, and Wellcome Trust. He got his PhD from the University of Leeds in 2009 for work which evaluated the usefulness of patient information about medicines. Donald got his first degree in behavioral sciences from the University of Paisley in 1996, which explains his empirical study of conferences. Donald first wrote about conferences in 2003 when he was asked to devise an internal report on one. He is now establishing himself as a leading commentator on conferences, having written editorials for Recente Progressi in Medicini and the Journal of Research in Nursing, and most notably in his recent book, Academic Conferences as Neoliberal Commodities, which came out in 2017. His book provided a catalog of problems with academic conferences, ranging from travel and the lived experience of the conference delegate through to conferences being a commodity and reinforcing the tenets of neoliberalism. His book has received generous praise for being, quote, definitely and deliberately an unconventional book, allowing him to carry out work with the care and passion of genuine and sustained intellectual curiosity, rather than having to follow perhaps narrower academic structures, end quote, from Professor Kevin Morrell. And with no small amount of prescience, was predicated to serve as a provocative keynote lecture designed to trigger further conversation in its wake. So as Donald will now show in his presentation, he has only just begun to carve out his niche and his approach to empirically examining conferences. He has many ideas for where he wants to go next with his examination, but just needs, like all of us, to gather an audience, pin down a research grant, and maybe gain a publisher. Tonight he has at least the first. So I'm quite curious to hear what Donald has to deliver in his keynote as a commentator on the actual institution that we are all attending right now, an academic conference. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you kindly and um, thank you for being here so late. I, I know you've probably got better things to do, but it's, it's great to be here. Um, thank you, Lowry, for that wonderful, warm introduction. That was very kind. Um, thank you very much for the outnodiging. Yeah? Is, is that correct? Yeah, my Netherlands is not good, but um, better than my Deutsch. Um, and a thank you to the association. This is a real, true, wonderful um, privilege to be talking to you tonight. So, I think that's me. Um, thank to everyone. Yep. So, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to talk to you about the impact of borders on conferences. And I'm going to do so in three ways. I'm going to talk about um, the impact of borders on conferences, conferences on borders, and borders on academia. Now, why am I talking about that? Well, back in 2006 at the Institute of um, the social pharmacy workshop conference that was attending in Oxford. There was a vote taken to ask people which um, conference they wanted to attend in two years' time. And there was um, the option of Amsterdam, there was um, Queenstown, New Zealand, and there was somewhere else, I think it was Portugal. Now, I voted for Amsterdam because I wanted to be able to go to see my beloved Utrecht, but also um, it would give me the opportunity to do short-haul travel because back in 1991, I had a cerebral insult, a bleed to the brain that caused me to go into comatose and also um, put a prohibition on me doing long-haul travel. So imagine my shock when I found out that Queenstown, New Zealand had won. Disappointed to say the least. But I got things checked out with my um, consultant and he said, you're fine, you can do the long haul travel. So the point of me reciting this story to you is that it shows where I'm coming from in part, that my, um, 
My interests in conferences and travel were in part born out of my own personal experiences. So that's why tonight I'm talking to you. I'm taking that on a little bit further and talking about um, conferences in relation to borders. What you see there is basically how I perceive conferences in my head um, for so long. I'd been to 20 plus over the course of my career at the point when I decided to write a book about conferences and I thought, well, I've been to 20 plus, presented at most of them, listened to a couple of hundred presentations. Did they actually come to something? Was there a, a clear signal that came out of any of these conferences, these health services research conferences that I attended, or did they just merely generate noise? And that was my, my reasoning and my reckoning for looking at it. But I want you to remember that slide because that shows you how I perceived conferences before. And eventually you're going to see how I actually, um, how through looking at conferences in relation to borderland studies and the borders, I'm now conceptualizing them in a different way in my head. So I suppose the, what you see there, um, conferences within borders, that's the most friendly of the three concepts I'm going to introduce to you. It's relating to border, border studies, physical space, and also there's elements of geopolitics in it. The three flags no one needs mentioning about, but the point that I'm going to raise here is that I think we're living in a climate nowadays where the consequences of governments are having an impact on people wanting to attend conferences or even just simply doing academia itself. So in the US, you have the Trump ban, which is having an impact on people, which is stopping people from seven um, majority Muslim countries entering the states. In Austria, there's, I believe, when I was doing my homework, I found out that there was a, a ban on full face um, coverings, which in effect stops Muslim women from wearing the full face veil. And incidentally also stopped me from coming here dressed up as Batman, the, the mask. That's, that's the one joke, don't worry. And in the UK, we have Brexit. Um, when I was writing this, I, I, the last couple of weeks, I was thinking, well, I don't have a clue what the hell's happening with Brexit. And just looking at the news over the last couple of days, I have even less of a crew, clue what's happening. But basically, what we're seeing is um, this is having an impact on people entering the UK. And in the future, it's probably going to have an impact on people like myself who are wanting to go from the British Isles into Europe. Again, doing my homework for this, one of the things that I found out was that it's not just the possibilities that Brexit might be putting a stop in people entering the UK. There's also, it's actually happening already. And when I was finishing writing off my book in 2016, I noticed there was um, a conference in Cambridge, the, Associ the, a the Association's Studies, the African Studies Association UK. And there were a number of scholars who'd gained, who'd had their abstracts accepted and were, had the funding in place and were invited to attend the conference, but they were stopped by border security from doing so. Some of them with dubious reasons um, for, for that. So that shows you that there's, there's something happening in the UK at the moment, and in particular at the, the, AS, the ASA UK example. One of the people that was stopped, one of the scholars, was a woman who was the wife of a fellow presenter, and the argument that was made was that she was stopped because her husband had already been given entry into the UK, and it was feared that if she did a swell that they would want to stay. What we're seeing here is xenophobic um, and highly ridiculous arguments being made by border security, 
by the British government in stopping academics from entering the UK. There was another example, um, Professor Alison Phipps, who holds the UNESCO Chair in Refugee Studies at the University of Glasgow. She, um, at her inaugural lecture, she wanted to have a dance troupe to come and perform um, to celebrate the culture that different migrant groups bring to the British Isles. And they were stopped from gaining entry. And this was picked up in the, in the press by Karen Goodwin, who noted the restrictions that were made on those visitors. And Professor Phipps has said, said that effectively there's now a universal ban on travel from the global south countries, regardless of whether you're a world-leading academic or an artist or a first-time traveller on a humanitarian or development project working with UK institutions. We can only surmise that there is a secret travel ban in place now in the Home Office. So it's happening. It's not just a possibility with Brexit. It is happening right now, and it's probably only going to get worse. But over and above that, there was another example that was given to me, um, suggested to me by Serene Chalmers, who founded the Cochrane Collaboration and the James Lind Alliance which are big names in the world of health services research, which I worked in. And he gave me the example of the Lancet Palestinian Healthcare Alliance, a conference that's held regularly in the Middle East that brings together scholars, researchers, um, members of the general public, healthcare professionals, who are all interested in the healthcare of people from Palestine and present their research around that. And in this case, there were 15 people from, um, from the Gaza that were invited to take part, no, sorry, yeah, from the Gaza Strip, who had their abstracts accepted and were um, able to take part in the conference. And again, only two of them were given visas to actually go and attend the actual conference itself and presented it. And as Serene Chalmers said to me, um, that I said in my um, abstract that I made the point that border security has for some become as important a hurdle to clear as getting your conference abstract accepted. This is nowhere more felt than by my Palestinian colleagues in Gaza. So it's not just happening in the UK, it's happening elsewhere in the world as well. People have been stopped by border security, they've been denied visas. Machtok told me that it's happened here just this week, that people have been denied visas after getting their abstracts accepted. It's becoming a more common problem across different countries. This is a favourite slide of mine. It goes back to before my book got published. The logo you see is of the Cochrane Collaboration which is a big name player in the world of health services research, which I worked in until the end of last week. So that's a hint if anyone wants to offer me a job. Yeah. So the Cochrane Collaboration brings together leading academics from around the world to work on um, synthesizing the best available evidence to offer evidence-based recommendations on what's effective in terms of healthcare, what works, what's dangerous, what should be done, what should not. And being an international organisation, they hold an annual world conference or colloquium. And that's, that brings together the leading lights from the four corners of the globe. And as you can see in this slide, the lettering in red represents conferences that were held in the Northern Hemisphere and the one that's shaded in blue is the Southern Hemisphere. And what this shows is that two thirds have been held in the Northern Hemisphere and one third in the Southern Hemisphere. It's very difficult trying to find one place in this big globe or small globe to try and bring together people from all four corners and to bring them and get them discussing work, doing their research at a conference. So, the next concept, borders within conferences. This is more sort of social, um, psychological, it 
brings together. It's, it's more about the experience of the conference and how the hierarchical nature that's played out at conferences can impact on people who are attending and presenting. No one needs to be told the great Michel Foucault. Um, now, he was a man who was not short of a word or two, and there's a great um, thing that's available on YouTube, a, dis a debate between him and Norm Chomsky from 1971 in Nederland, in Eindhoven, where it was recorded, and they were debating, I think it was human nature or something, and obviously Foucault had a, a thing or two to say about that. But if you watch this, it's available on YouTube and the URL's down there if anyone wants to type it in. If you actually watch that clip, at the start, they're speaking in English and Chomsky's answering for about three or four minutes, and then it goes to Foucault, and the Dutch chair asks him a question in English, and he goes, well, if you don't mind, I'm ashamed of my English, I would rather reply to you in French. And he does so in a very timid way. He's very sort of reticent and nervous. But then all of a sudden, he props up and starts speaking French so eloquently, so confidently. And that made me think, at conferences like this one, international conferences, the lingua franca is more often than not English. And for many people, that is not their first language. Now, for me, it is, so I'm at an advantage. But for the people who are not, I wonder if sometimes they feel it's a bit more demanding and more of a mental strain on them to have to do the translation, especially if they're tired, because conferences are long, tiring events. But it doesn't have to actually be like that, just to say. Back in um, 2003, the first conference I attended was in Barcelona. And at that conference, part of it was conducted in Spanish. And you could get earpieces, so you could actually listen to a real-time translation. But anyway, another thing that I find quite interesting is the idea of potential conflict at conferences. Um, I think conflict can be a good thing. Um, through conflict, we get change, we develop, we get new knowledge, etc., etc. I think it was Freud who was the first to actually suggest that conflict can lead to development and knowledge and change and whatnot else. Just name checked a local for you there. But anyway, taking you back to 1986, um, this is an example of a conference that was held in Strathclyde University in Glasgow. And this brought together linguists and literary theorists. So you've got social scientists and the humanities. And the, the thinking was that by having those two diverse groups who have a sort of small overlap, that they would enable a, that it would enable a, a dialect, an opportunity for discussion, for new knowledge to be developed. And when I got speaking to the, one of the organisers of it for my book, I asked him, well, did it actually do anything? And he said, well, no, not really. We, we, we tried to get them talking, but they were just, they weren't interested in speaking to each other. They were speaking, just staying in their own camps. And that was something that came out just in general when I was, when I was, talking to people for the book, um, just in general about communication at conferences. And they were saying, well, one of the persons said, well, when people attend a conference, they speak the same language, the same technical language. So this doesn't challenge the host paradigm. But then someone else said something, again, unrelated to this conference, but they said, sometimes there's a lack of communication between attendees because they fit into silos and so do not talk to each other. And I think that's what was happening in this example. The people were remaining in their own silos and they weren't talking. So you weren't getting that opportunity to have a dialectic, to have a conflict, to have a change. 
lost opportunity, perhaps. So the third concept, borders between conferences and paradigms. This is an example, I think it's in my book or one of the blogs that I wrote. Um, it was taken off YouTube, there was, well not YouTube, but I attended the Mixed Methods Conference in 2011 um, at the University of Leeds and Professor Norm Denzen did a keynote um, by video link and he was talking about there being two conferences, the Mixed Methods one being conducted in Leeds and one also being conducted in Manchester just a week later, uh, a more sociological, social theory one. And he was saying, we've got this conference here talking about methodology, and we've got another one that's talking about social theory. There could be a chance for the two to overlap and to have that dialectic, but it's been missed because they're being held slightly separate places one week apart. And doing my homework for this conference, I noted that just next month in this very building, they're holding the Mixed Methods International Conference. So we could say the same thing here. There's an opportunity for border studies and mixed methods to be having cross-contamination, to be having discussions, but it can't happen because it's different people speaking at different times from the same venue, so it's another lost opportunity. So if you remember back at the start, I was saying, well, in my Emmental brain, I used to think of conferences as just basically a matrix of times and dates and places, but this is actually how I perceive conferences now. So top left is the conferences within borders. Top right, the hierarchical nature is the borders within conferences. And bottom left is the borders between conferences. But the important thing to note here is they're not actually mutually exclusive. They're actually, you can have a conference that is both a conference within a border, and it can also have borders within that conference, and it may well be bordering against other conferences. So don't think of them as all being separate, they're not. Again, doing my homework for coming here, um, and this is just as a little aside, um, I call it universities within borders. Same idea as conferences within borders, but I noted um, the Central European University where it's going to be held on Thursday and Friday. There's, this is actually a university that's registered in the state of New York. And so it's not actually a Hungarian university, although that's where it's based. And the Hungarian government have um, created a new law um, to regulate foreign-based universities, etc., etc. And so that's something that impacts on the CEU. And as John Shattuck said, the president of the Central European University, but in another period of time, which is as disruptive and complicated as in 91, when the university was founded, financial crash, loss of conf confidence in party politics in the West, the rise of the Putin model of government, the weakness of international institutions are all raising set of questions that haven't been asked for 25 years. We see very dangerous trends at work, such as the rise of xenophobia and antagonism towards immigrants. Now, just as conference attendance for some can be impeded or denied by state policy, I think what this represents is a state-sanctioned attack on a place of learning. And it's something that we should be quite angry about and we should be kicking up our fuss. It's unjustifiable and unwelcome. It's an example of lunacy and unlightened and xenophobic government that we have in, abun in abundance. So, 
One of the things that I've picked up just from the short time that I've been here today, this is the first time I've ever been introduced to Borderland Studies or anything, is that I'm aware that there's not real. I don't know if it's fair to say, but I don't think there's any great underlying framework for Borderland Studies. There's different things that people are drawing from, um, but there's nothing yet that's set in stone. So. If I was suggesting, in, in the line of work that I did, health services research, it's quite common to do um, evidence-based recommendations um, to say, this is the research we did, this is what we recommend you do based on the evidence that we found, this is what you need to change. And I'm actually taking that a step back, first of all, and saying what we need, first of all, is if we're going to try and improve the conference experience, we need to have a framework for change. And this is what I've got here. So you see the three concepts on the left-hand side that I've been talking about. And then what I've tried to do is um, identify some antecedents for each. So I think for conferences within borders, as I said, geography, um, geopolitics, and financial aspects can all be antecedents for that problem. And the consequences are that there's actual prospective conference attendance or knowledge development. And the list goes on. For borders within conferences, as I said, the, the antecedents there are more psychological or sociological or based on conference culture. And again, the consequences can be conference identity, knowledge development, career development. And then for borders between conferences, the um, the antecedents are time, travel, distance, geography, again, conference identity. The thing to note that in all three examples, I think something that will suffer is knowledge development. And as scholars, as academics, we should all be concerned about that. Um, did you? Whoops. Right, so if Matt were here, I'd just give us some sort of more practical examples for what can be done to a conference to try and make it more, um, to improve the experience of the conference, to, to make it perhaps more engaging. Not that I'm saying this isn't engaging, but this could be taken on board by anyone. And I think my, my examples aren't so, they aren't as, um, specific as some might think, um, not specific, what's the word? They're not perhaps as um, immediately relevant as some might think, but I think there are things that we need to be wary about. So social media, the idea that the people who cannot attend the conference, well, they could maybe sit behind a screen, a computer, or sit with people in a dark room and watch it, and then that's, that's great. Yeah, they, they can share in that experience. They can listen to the people talk. However, as we all know here, the magic of a conference is not about listening to people or sitting in on a workshop or learning. It's about those magical moments that happen afterwards in the conference bar when you speak to people and you talk about your, your work, et cetera, et cetera, and you fire off ideas off one another. I think there's a great difficulty in trying to, trying to harness that and foster that from a social media setting. Another thing I see is um, the suggestion of having unconferencing, where you bring people together for a conference, but rather than it having a set agenda, instead people bring their own ideas to the table and they make votes on what they'll discuss, and they go away and discuss it, and it's all very free-flowing, etc., etc. I can see the value of that. I think that's very, that can be useful, but I don't think it could be useful for, say, for example, over the course of the four days here. I think you do need to have some structure with a conference when it's being organized and run. So you could maybe have it as a breakout session for an hour or two where people just come together and um, put their hands up and ask questions and make suggestions and 
talk informally, but I don't think you could have for an international organisation like this having it over four days. Then there's the idea of return on investment and I have problems with this from a methodological and uh, an ethical point of view. Methodologically, I think it's almost impossible to try and show that's a causal relation between the conference and having, quote unquote, a return on investment. I don't think that's entirely possible. There's so many different extraneous variables going on. But more so from an ethical point of view, um, if you're Machtelt and you're charged with running this conference, the last thing you want is to be measured on it and for someone to say that's not had a return on investment. In this modern day and age, academia is difficult and precarious enough without being told your conference did not have any return on investment. So, conclusion might not be the, the right name for this slide, um, but I would say that borders, border control and governments are having an impact on conferences and academia, obstructing people from attending conferences and interfering with academic institutions. I think these external and internal borders can determine who will and will not prospectively or actually attend a conference and can impact on the act of participation of attendees. Conference identity and paradigms will reinforce metaphorical borders with other conferences. Each conceptual border will have an unwarranted effect on an essence or conference activity or knowledge generation. And as the last point I would say, I think the paradigm wars of the 21st century are not now being fought out between qualitative and quantitative, psychological and sociological or whatever. I think we're now starting to see that there's conflicts developing between government institutions, governments, um, politicians and elements of academia. And I think there's a great problem there. So that's me done. Um, just to say, um, I'm not going to be going to Budapest. I'm just going to be here in Vienna um, for the next couple of days. Um, so if anyone wants to speak to me, um, you've got my electronic means. Or if you want to, you can tap me on the shoulder and suggest we go for a beer. Or if it's before midday, then it might be more appropriate to go for a coffee. But anyway, thank you for listening. I know this is the this is the question section or not? Any questions? Or does everyone just want to go away now because it's been such a long day? Believe me, I'm I'm really not good at answering questions. If <laughs> so, it would it would be a great help because I I was thinking in my brain, well. I don't know if anyone here remembers um, Father Ted. No? Father Ted? Yeah? Excellent. Um, Father Ted, for those who don't know, was a comedy show in the UK with three priests. Um, there was Ted, who was the conniving one, Dougal, the man-child, and Father Jack, who had Veronica Corsica's syndrome and would only say three, three words, which were basically swearing. One of them was drink. But there was an episode where the, the bishops, three bishops were coming to the island and they thought, well, actually it might be a bit more conducive, guys, if we um, taught Father Jack something new rather than just saying drink. And so they taught him to say that would be an ecumenical matter which was quite impressive to say the least and a, basically a catch-all answer to anything. So if anyone does want to ans ask me a question, I'm quite tempted just to answer. That would be a research governance matter. Michelle.
Oh, that, that was um, the one for the Strathclyde University Conference, you mean? The, the, there was a, a concert ticket. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the concert ticket was um, from Simple Minds who played in Glasgow in 1986 at Ibrox Park, and that was the concert ticket. And I just thought I would put that in there because it was, um, it was 1986, the same year as the conference. Yes. I'm, I'm not aware of any models. They, they probably do exist, but um, as you might have seen from some of my recommendations, I'm, I'm sort of half and half on the idea that methodologically that, that, you, could, that you could use a specific model or framework within a conference to um, instigate a change. So, from that point of view, um, the, there's stuff that's starting to um, be developed that does look at return on investment and ways to try and generate that within our conference framework. But as I was saying, I'm, I'm quite critical of that um, for methodological and ethical reasons. So. Um, Apologies if that's slightly fudging um, your question. I hope it helps. Okay. And 
Yeah, and that actually goes back to a point that came out in the research I did for my book where people were saying, well, quite often when people are talking to one another at conferences, they're talking beyond them, they're not talking to them, they're reciting something and just saying that and not checking for do you understand or do you care, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it does make you think if if, as my second slide, the, the noise slide, as I like to refer to it, if that really is all we're doing, if we, if we just all stand up and do our talk and generate noise, and does anything really come out of it, if indeed anything really can come out of it, because the hard work for conferences, as Machtold would probably say, is not done in the here and now of the conference itself, but it's actually done in the weeks, months and years beforehand when people are doing all the, the difficult work to, to ensure that the venue is found and that the people are invited and etc. etc. So I think that's, that's something that we have to um, bear in mind. Um, kind of weird to talk about a total anticlimax. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers um, the Monty Python and the Holy Grail, the way it ended, yeah? Which was basically there was a fight going on and then the police fans come running in and then it just, the, it, the wheel runs out um, on, the, on the film. That, that, feels, that feels a little bit like how it is right now, so it's, I suppose it's up to me to say, well, thank you, Donald, um, for um, coming here and speaking tonight. Um, 
Thank you all for staying here and listening. Thank you.